Thanks a lot for coming to my session. My name is Lakonde Mwila, and I'm a product manager at AWS, specifically in the Amazon EKS team. And I'm going to be speaking to you about how to establish trust between technically diverse or heterogeneous service mesh implementations. If any of you want to connect with me, please feel free to do so. Uh, ideally, you could connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm relatively active over there. And for those of you that are interested in watching cloud native content, specifically related to Kubernetes or Istio or Spiffy Inspire, uh, you can check out my YouTube channel. Just search using my full name, and maybe there'll be something that's useful for you over there. Great. So I was hoping to start this session with a bit of an exercise, but I thought it might be relatively complicated. Um, I was going to use uh, balls of yarn to illustrate uh, a core part of the problem that I want to focus on in this session. And so I'm just going to describe it so you can get your imagination going as I describe this. So imagine I had um, balls of yarn with me, and then I handed them out to everyone over here. And then the exercise would essentially be for you to, would be for you to unravel it or unroll it, hold on to a piece of it, and then pass it on to the next person until everyone is touching a piece of yarn that was started by someone else. Now, if we were to take a snapshot of that from the top down, sort of a bird's eye view, it would kind of look like a mess. It would be colorful, but it would be relatively messy. And uh, that would be a relatively accurate picture of many modern systems. Not all, but many modern systems. And the reason for that is because a lot of teams are shifting towards uh, a microservice model. And so microservices are very beneficial because it allows teams or companies to essentially innovate with small incremental steps, modular components that are a single purpose. It doesn't mean that they necessarily do away with monolithic architectures or other legacy systems, they're still in the mix. But what's happening is this kind of progression adds to a mix that I typically like to refer to as a web of complexity. And this web of complexity grows in, compl um, in complexity as well as size over time because teams are still going to be dedicated to improving their systems, improving innovation, um, and adding to their system overall as new requirements come up, as new enhancements are happening. And as beneficial as it is to have a microservice architecture because of all the advantages that it introduces, we have to be able to find a way of identifying who's who. Because in these kinds of systems, you're more reliant on the network and service-to-service -service communication. So how do you keep track of the different participants in your web of complexity. That's extremely important from a security perspective. It heightens the risks uh, when there are additional components and you're not able to keep track of them. You want to be able to know who's who in this large space. Now, a common approach that teams will use to address this is to essentially find a way of integrating the different security standards that are supported by the different systems, whether it's the legacy systems, the microservices, and the monolith systems. And this can definitely work, and it's something that I've witnessed, but it becomes very challenging for various reasons. For one, it typically requires the key stakeholders to get together over and over again, key stakeholders being your security architects, your platform teams, and your application developers. There needs to be alignment between them because you are trying to find a way of bridging these different security standards that are supported by the communicating systems. And this can be tough. And as the innovation continues and the web of complexity grows, um, so will the length and the necessity of those respective meetings between these stakeholders. Now, in addition to that, your application developers will also have to be continuously modifying their code, especially if they're integrating libraries um, that will be supporting these application networking concerns. And that's something that also adds a cognitive load to their jobs, and they start to take on more things that would probably fall outside of their purview. Almost skipped some two, two very important ones. Next is security misconfigurations, right? So that it heightens the risks of that as well because of what's being juggled by your application developers, but not only them, even for platform engineers. And then the last one is a very common reality. This is hard to accomplish. And so some teams will kick the can down the road. They'll defer the problem so that they can prioritize velocity. And um, 
the challenge with this is the problem isn't necessarily going away. If anything, your can that you're kicking down the road is going to get bigger and heavier with time, especially as the web of complexity continues to grow, because you haven't exactly put a halt on system improvements with additional microservices or any other integrations that are being added into the mix. So as much as we should be asking the question, how do we establish uh, trust in the web of complexity, we should be asking what is the best way? Because we can certainly still establish trust by integrating different security standards, but as I just walked through um, a couple of different challenges it introduces, we want to find a way of alleviating those particular problems. And a common approach that teams use is to uh, adopt a service mesh, to essentially short circuit or fast track um, having this trust domain, essentially. A space where your workloads and your applications can communicate securely. And um, there are a host of different service mesh implementations. And service meshes essentially deal with your appli application networking concerns. Um, but in many cases, teams will adopt them uh, primarily to address mutual authentication. They want end-to-end -end encryption. They want to have an identity management system which service meshes come with so they can benefit from that. And so the flow that we're essentially working towards, which service meshes can give us, is to start from a place of no implicit trust whatsoever. So that means every single application that will exist in this web of complexity or does exist in this web of complexity should essentially or, event, or rather work its way towards being part of what we would refer to as a trust domain. Starting from a place of no implicit trust whatsoever, and then you attest, you attest it through some specific criteria. And then after it goes through the attestation only successfully, only then will it be issued an identity and be allowed to participate in your trust domain. And so this is the end goal, essentially. You want your web of complexity to exist within a trust domain where all the participants have been validated or verified and have received an identity that they can then present to any other participant um, to, to, show that they, to show who they are and for every other peer to be able to validate that identity. Now, that does solve the problem. And so we could say, great, I've got a trust domain for a particular service mesh. But what if you're in a situation where there are multiple service mesh implementations? So team A is using Istio with the sidecar data plane. Team B is using Istio ambient mesh. Team C is using Cilium. So how do we establish trust in those kinds of situations? Because each one has a distinct identity management system. And I'll cover where this can be particularly helpful. So an analogy that I like to use um, is one based on a real life scenario. So years ago, when I was working in consulting, I worked for a particular consulting firm, and I was issued a company card, which gave me access to the company building. Now, while I was working for that particular consulting firm, I was representing that firm at a financial institution. And I couldn't exactly use the company card from the consulting firm at the financial institution. It wasn't going to work. So that was an identity for a particular quote unquote trust domain, which was the consultation firm that I worked for. And so at the financial institution, they needed to issue me a whole new identity or card. Now, if you think back to what I was covering before, uh, we don't want our applications to be in a situation where they are juggling uh, multiple security standards. This is similar to this. Imagine. Um, I happen to be working at six different companies. That means all of a sudden, now I'm juggling six different company cards. So what we're trying to establish here is a mechanism for having one ID that can be universally attestable and identified or can work as an identification regardless of any other trust domain that I might, I might find myself in. And this is very similar to none other than the passport system which is universal. And I can very much relate to this because I'm Zambian, but I live in South Africa, and I made a trip over here to the US. But in those different steps, I used one identity document. I used my passport. And for each of the different countries, you have, there are, you have different, uh, separate passports for each representing each one of them. They have their separate authorities that are represented with each one of these distinct countries. However, there is a universal system that is used to 
essentially verify the validity of that particular document, even though it wasn't issued in that specific country. And that's essentially what we want to translate um, to our environments with the web of complexity. How do we have a passport-like system? And that serves as an entree for SPIFI, uh, which stands for um, Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. It's so funny, for a moment there, I almost said Special Identity Framework. So I was like, that's not what it stands for. And this is basically a set of open standards or specifications um, that enable you to have interoperable IDs or platform agnostic IDs, as well as attest those IDs for workloads as well as infrastructure components. Now, uh, these SPIFI standards have also been implemented in a production-ready system, and that would be Spire. Both of them are open source projects. And in this session, I'm going to specifically focus um, on Spire, and that's what I'll be using in my demo. So if we go back to that diagram that I showed earlier, Spire essentially allows us, and even the SPIFI specifications, if you happen to implement them in your own custom way, allow us to walk through the same model, where we start with no implicit trust whatsoever, and then based on a certain criteria that we configure, we can attest a workload, for example. And that could be based on a certain container that it should be running, um, the namespace that that container should be running in. Um, in addition, it could also, you can also attest infrastructure components. Um, and that, that helps us work towards a space where we're validating anything that is eventually going to live in our trust domain. So after successful attestation, then it will be issued an identity and end up in the destination that we want. So we still have our web of complexity, but the difference is now we have it living inside of a trust domain that has a universal identity model or a universal standard for security. Now, how does that tie to bridging different service meshes? Well, if we're using an interoperable standard like what Spiffy gives us, then that means irrespective of the service mesh implementation that we're using, whether it's a custom Envoy Mesh or Istio or Cilium, as long as they support an integration with this interoperable mechanism, then we can essentially have a single uh, root of trust. And by that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a single Spire server. This is their different deployment models. You could do that. And in the demo that I'll be showing, that's the approach I'm following. You could have a single Spire server that essentially functions as the root certificate authority. And it distributes identities to the separate service mesh implementations. Alternatively, you could have a Spire server for each service mesh, and then you could federate trust between them. And what happens in that is essentially there is an exchange of trust bundles so that each Spire server has a quote unquote foreign trust bundle with a certificate that it can pass on to the workloads in its respective trust domain, and the workloads will then be able to use the certificate in that trust bundle to validate a peer in a foreign trust domain. Right, now, very important. We have to ask the question, when is this actually useful? Because it is a complex thing. When would, we, when would you want to use this? And so the first one, um, and I kind of allude to this in the title, would be a situation where if a company happens to have a very strong um, approach to technical diversity. So sub companies are like this, where they, it's a form of empowering or enabling the different teams that exist in their org and saying, you can choose the technology that you want to use for uh, whatever it is you're running. And I've seen some uh, central platform teams will essentially build a system that uh, vends technologies to the different internal teams. And the internal teams will essentially just enable the technologies that they want to use. So if you want to use Istio, you would enable that as a consumer from this particular platform. Team B may enable Cilium. So in scenarios like that, that's where this becomes useful because there may still be required integrations between these separate teams that are in the same organization and they have heterogeneous systems running. Another one would be integrations with an external organization. So you don't have as much influence on the technology that they're using, but you need to integrate with them. And then the third one would be migrating from one service mesh to another. And you may not necessarily be waiting for all your workloads to be, to be migrated to the new service mesh. And so in the process, you still want to be able to keep the integrations alive between workloads that perhaps were running in Istio. And now if you've started in a migration to Cilium or if you've started a migration to Istio Ambient Mesh and you want to maintain that communication between those workloads, then this gives you, uh, this essentially enables that process because you can still have 
that trust between them, even though they are distinct meshes. And by distinct, I specifically mean um, they're technically different. All right, so before I get into the demo, I just want to walk through some context to help uh, set the stage. And so what I'm going to be demonstrating is communication between a custom Envoy mesh and uh, an Istio service mesh. And for the Istio service mesh, I'm using the sidecar data plane, so not ambient mesh. Sorry to disappoint if, um, if you were looking forward to that. And so just to quickly run through this, and I'm actually going to get down here so that I can see this clearly. So this will look a lot like Istio and its sidecar model, because essentially, um, for every microservice that I'm deploying, so I've got a GraphQL API, I've got orders, I've got products, and an edge proxy. And each of the microservices has an Envoy proxy in front of it, so very similar to the, um, the Istio data plane and the sidecar Istio data plane. And our edge proxy over here um, is just an Envoy proxy, and so it's going to receive requests uh, from the load balancer, and we'll proxy them, proxy any requests onto the different microservices. And now I've got a Spire server running inside of my Kubernetes cluster, and um, the Spire agent essentially communicates with the Spire server. The Spire agent is a daemon set, and it serves what is known as the workload API. And the workload API is what's responsible for actually distributing these identities. The identities could either be JOTs or X.509 certificates. And so the Spire agent is what is communicating with the Envoy proxies. So, both, uh, so Envoy has the SDS API, Secret Discovery Service, for it to be able to fetch remote secrets. And, and in this case, those secrets are the X.509 certificates. And Spire also supports the SDS API, enabling it to function as that server to push those certificates. So that's the custom Envoy mesh. And then next is my Istio mesh. But I want to start off by just describing how the default uh, flow works. With, with issuing of identities, in case you, you're unfamiliar with that. So the Istio agent essentially sends a certificate signing request to Istio D. Istio D functions by default as the root certificate authority when you install it. And then the Istio, Istio D is then going to sign that certificate um, and then will issue back an SVID, which is a spiffy verifiable identity document, an X.509 cert to the Envoy proxy, and that's what it will use as its identity. Now, when integrating with Spire, what I'm essentially doing is I'm telling Istio D to take a step back, and Spire essentially becomes the root certificate authority. And so as I mentioned before, there are different deployment models. I could have set up a Spire server distinctly for Istio and a Spire server distinctly for the Envoy mesh and had federated trust between them. But in this case, it's one Spire server with a single trust domain issuing these identities to the custom Envoy mesh as well as to the Istio Envoy mesh. And so this is what we have. And what I'm going to be demonstrating is I have configured the edge proxy inside of the custom Envoy mesh to forward any, any requests that are directly sent to the product's API to be forwarded to products inside of the Istio uh, service mesh. And what I've done with Istio is I have set it to strict mode in terms of the mutual authentication. And so when mutual authentication is set to strict mode using the peer authentication configurations, that essentially means that every participant inside of that mesh enforces validation on both sides and of, uh, enforces the um, validation of identity on both sides. So basically making sure there has to be uh, mutual authentication. And so that means that in order for this request to work, um, there has to be trust between the edge proxy and the products API in the Istio service mesh. And in this case, because these have the same root of trust, um, that essentially is what enables successful communication and encryption between both parties. And you can still configure this at a lower level, and that's something that I'll show you, where you could essentially still determine the SANS or the spiffy IDs that you want to be approved so that you take it a, a more granular level as opposed to just saying, well, if it's part of this trust domain, then go ahead and establish trust. You can make it even more granular and say it has to be a certificate that specifically has this spiffy ID. All right. So first off, 
just want to show you what is going on, going on inside of the cluster over here. So at the top over there, you'll see Edge Proxy, GraphQL, orders and products, and each of these are inside the e-commerce namespace. So this is essentially uh, where the custom Envoy mesh, this, associate, this is uh, in reference to the custom Envoy mesh. And then below it, a little bit over here, you'll see Graph, again, GraphQL orders and products, but you'll notice these are inside the Istio e-commerce namespace because these reside inside of Istio. So that's just so you can see our two meshes in action over there. Next thing that I want to walk through just briefly is for you to see these configs. And I'm going to try and do this without hurting my neck. I'm going to try and just cover the relevant parts to short circuit this. And so this is the configuration for the Spire agent. So if you recall, I said the Spire agent is what serves the workload API that actually distributes uh, these certificates. And so I've configured the socket path over here. And so this is what the consumers essentially need to be able to connect to in order for them to receive those certificates or identities. So now if I come to my Istio configuration, um, this is essentially mod me modifying um, the sidecar injections and how that essentially starts up so that the Istio proxy um, now, so that each Istio proxy now essentially knows that it should be getting its certificates from this particular socket path that gets mounted over here. And you'll see that this matches with the agent um, configuration that I specified before. So this is essentially just telling Istio for every sidecar proxy that starts up, um, fetch your certificate from this particular location. These are the config files, just showing you that I'm enforcing mutual authentication within the service mesh. So it is set to strict mode. So having this one config over here uh, default for the Istio system namespace would actually be sufficient, because then that enforces it for the entire service mesh. Um, or you could do it at a namespace level, which you can see over here. This is set to strict. The alternative would be permissive, in which case um, mutual authentication won't be a hard or strict requirement. And then for the microservices, uh, this is specifically orders, but it's to give you an idea of what it looks like for them. This is now transitioning to the custom Envoy mesh. Uh, this is essentially the configuration, and so this is a cluster. So clusters are essentially the upstream hosts um, that the Envoy proxy communicates with. And this is the endpoint and the path associated with it. So this is basically so that Envoy knows that this is where it should fetch its certificate from. So it's communicating with the Spire agent, which remember is a daemon set that is running on the node. So that's the same configuration that is shared across the different um, applications or microservices running in the custom Envoy mesh. Now, if I specifically come over here to the edge proxy, which if you recall, I mentioned that I'm redirecting any requests that are destined for the product's API to actually go outside of the custom Envoy mesh and instead be redirected to the Istio service mesh. And I think if I scroll up, there we go. So you'll see over here, so I'm in the cluster section. So again, this is in reference to the upstream hosts. This is products over here, and if you come down specifically, I've highlighted the address over here. You'll see this is product service, but specifically Istio e-commerce uh, namespace. So this is going to hit the product service in the, in the e Istio service mesh. And I want to scroll down here so that you can see that under the configurations that I've set up, I've essentially said that you should um, only approve or accept uh, these uh, certificates that contain these particular spiffy IDs. So this is the default and the original one for the custom Envoy mesh. As you can see over here, this is running an e this is for, an e for the e-commerce namespace. But because, I'm also, because I've redirected the traffic to communicate with products in the Istio service mesh, I have added this additional spiffy ID as acceptable so that when it is presented with that certificate from the product's API in the Istio service mesh, it will accept it. All right, so um, switch to Postman. I'm trying to find this. There we go. Great. Can everyone see this clearly? OK. Good. Right, so the two on the left over here, 
These are requests specifically for the Istio service mesh. So the first one is get products. And if you look down here, you'll see product 1A is an Envoy hoodie. Product 1B is, a, I believe, is a spiffy sticker. It's a bit hard to see from here. Um, and just so you know that this is working, I'm going to hit the send request over there. OK, great. So you can see that. And now if I was to come over here so that we can take a look. Let me scroll down slightly. So we can take a look at the orders products API. This is, again, still in the Istio service mesh. I'm going to hit that send request. And you'll see, so I'm getting back order details, but more specifically, if you look under products, I'm getting Envoy hoodie. So this is as, as expected. That is based on the list of products for the products API inside of Istio. Now, if we come here, this is now in, with reference to the custom Envoy mesh. And this is the API for get orders and products. So the request flow over here is from load balancer to the uh, edge proxy, and then from the edge proxy to orders, and then from orders to products. So that's a different path from the configuration that I changed, which was load balancer to edge proxy directly to products. So in this case, we should get the original um, we should get a response from products inside the custom Envoy mesh. And if you look here, you'll see that 1A is actually Kubernetes t-shirt. So it's a separate product list for the products API that is running in the custom Envoy mesh. But now, still in the custom Envoy mesh, but now I'm sending a request using the path that, I've, um, that has the updated configuration. So this is from the edge proxy to the products, to the products API. And remember, because I reconfigured that, what's going to happen is it's going to forward that request to the Istio service mesh. And you can already see it here. The list that I'm getting back is 1A Envoy hoodie, showing that that traffic is now successfully going through to the separate uh, service mesh. So that's an example of the bridged trust. And that is the end of my talk. OK. Uh, any questions? Yes, Basil. Um, irrespective of the service mesh integration with whether it's a self sign or a RTA uh, based certificate, no issues, no concerns, no challenges, right? Right. As long as it's got the shared uh, root of trust, right? So that's the key thing there is, is there um, an anchor of trust um, across the board? And remember, that anchor of trust could either be like it, it could be um, one upstream authority. Actually, it could even be a tier higher or hierarchically higher than Spire. So you could tap Spire into a different upstream authority. Um, and it, you could have a shared Spire server across the service meshes. Or you could have distinct Spire servers, exactly, and then have federated trust established between them. Okay. Yes? Could you flip that to where you Yes. Right. Yeah. The URI. Um, the URI. This is the URI format for the first Spiffy ID. Yeah. And you can. This is something that you can uh, generally modify. This is obviously this particular part is um, is the prefix for it for the Spiffy format, and then followed by your trust domain. So outlier.org is the name of my trust domain in this case. Yeah. And then after that, uh, generally, so you could go namespace, um, and then uh, the, right, so NS, and then the actual name of the namespace, and then SA representing service account, and then you have the name of the service account followed over here. But this is for a workload. So this looks slightly different if it's an infrastructure component that you're issuing an identity to, like, in, for example, a, a virtual machine that you wanted to issue to. Yeah, sure, and I'll, I'll try my best with that. So the key thing here is it comes down to what you're, um, what you're trying to accomplish. So the key thing with Spiffy is it's for if you want that interoperability, 
So for example, even um, so Istio out the box supports um, Spiffy, it just, it just implements part of the Spiffy specification. So it just uses the Spiffy IDs um, and the Spiffy verifiable identity documents. It doesn't give you an entire Spire. Um, and that essentially also enables Istio to have trust established um, not just within the mesh, but you can also have workloads that are outside of the mesh if they support that same kind of those same kinds of specifications. Um, so this is based. It's, uh, your question sounds more like um, an I, um, about the identity management system because Kubernetes has its own identity management system essentially. And so what you were referring to there with uh, the jots for the service account, so that works specifically within um, like the Kubernetes system itself. Uh, this is specifically this. This example is specifically for service meshes, um, and so yeah. I'm, am I sort of? Uh, am I? We can take it offline too. Okay, sure. I mean, if you want to have, like, we can have some back and forth. Sure. Okay, but I think I get, I think I get where you're heading at. All right. Any other questions? Nope. All right. Great. Well, thanks so much for sticking it through. <laughs>